great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Stephen Hill. He's the Legal Advisor uh, and Director of the Office of Legal Affairs at NATO. In that capacity, he advises the Secretary General of NATO and the Secretariat um, on all legal issues. Uh, Ms. I'm going to say Mr. Hill, but I should say Stephen no, Hill. No, please, Stephen please. Hill please yeah. Also uh, served as Legal Counselor to the um, uh, US mission uh, to the UN in New York and uh, also worked in the uh, legal unit at the International Civilian Office in Kosovo. And in both roles, roles his responsibilities included a strong policy component focused on supporting the rule of law in conflict and post-conflict situations. Stephen has also worked in the Office of the Legal Advisor at the US State Department, and you did a very broad career there, much of it in the area, I think, of, of human rights. We were talking about that earlier, right. and uh, conflict resolution, post-conflict resolution and was the chief U.S. negotiator for the landmark U.N. Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, a convention with which I am familiar and which was a great step forward, I think, in that area. So without more ado, we hand the floor to you and look forward to what you have to tell us. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Ambassador. Uh, let me also thank the Institute uh, for the kind invita invitation to, to speak here today. I really do appreciate uh, the chance to present my perspective uh, as the legal advisor for the NATO Secretary General uh, on one of uh, certainly the most pressing issues that I think is facing the transatlantic uh, community today. And I choose the word transatlantic carefully because I think that NATO-EU relations is uh, an issue of concern not just for European countries, but also for our whole transatlantic uh, community, including my uh, home country. Um, I do need to make a, 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 an official disclaimer, which is that my remarks are my own and uh, do not necessarily reflect the views of NATO or uh, its allies. Um, and before moving on to the topic, which is uh, NATO-EU relations from an international law perspective, I really would be remiss, uh, particularly in this lovely setting, if I didn't recall uh, that our Secretary General, uh, our then Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen was here uh, in this very house uh, in 2013 and he spoke about the great value we attach to Ireland's participation in the Partnership for Peace. Uh, and I can only say today uh, uh, to really reflect this, this same gratitude um, that NATO and our 29 allies remain uh, now as, as then grateful for, for the important contribution that Ireland makes uh, to the maintenance of international peace and security. This includes through UN peacekeeping, United Nations peacekeeping, we were talking about that uh, prior to this meeting, uh, but also to NATO-led operations, uh, for example, in Kosovo and in Afghanistan, and to a number of uh, NATO activities, uh, for example, our trust fund, uh, for countering IEDs, the improvised explosive devices, uh, that is really helping the situation in Iraq. And so we're, we're very grateful to that. Um, of course, this partnership fully respects and we fully respect Ireland's policy of neutrality. Uh, we think uh, that the, that the um, partnership is a valuable symbol of our mutual commitment to work together to promote the development of a just and peaceful international society that's based on the rule of law and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. And um, I say that not only uh, because we're here in Ireland, but because these values, the rule of law, respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, are the same values that are at the heart of the work that NATO and the European Union uh, are undertaking now. We share, indeed, uh, 22 of the same member states. So in NATO, we have uh, uh, 29 allies spanning from Turkey to uh, the US and Canada, uh, uh, with 22 EU member states uh, in between. Um, we had 28 up until, it was easier actually to do NATO-EU talks uh, up until June of this year because we had 28 and 28, but we've just had Montenegro join the fold uh, in June of this year, and that was an important development. So, uh, I mean, just by virtue of the fact that we share 22 uh, members, means that we have to stand together and work together to continue to protect the interests of our people uh, and their security. It's a pretty exciting time for NATO-EU relations. This NATO-EU relations are kind of a perennial, uh, as you know, uh, at least certainly since the end of the, 
uh, uh, the end of the Cold War. Um, but I, th- I particularly, I personally think it's a it's it's a very exciting time, and that's partly why I, I suggested this topic for for today. Um, let me just tell you why. So last July in Warsaw, uh, my boss, Secretary General Stoltenberg, signed a joint declaration with Presidents Juncker and Tusk, uh, also in the presence of High Representative Mogherini, uh, to set out the determination of NATO and the European Union to uh, move forward together, to increase the cooperation in a number of areas, and to do so in a spirit of collaboration and not competition. Uh, it, I think this was done uh, in recognition that it's vital that we make the most of the means that are at our disposal and not uh, waste them through duplication or unnecessary competition. I mean, this is part and parcel of the overall kind of economic and resources environment that we find us in as well. So this was a historic joint declaration. We've never had something like that with the European Union uh, before. And um, even more kind of operationally in December of now last year, we agreed to turn the joint declaration into a concrete working plan, uh, agreeing on 42 practical measures across a wide range of areas. I'll go into some of them a little bit later. Um, But even more important than these documents, which really really for for people who have followed kind of, uh, you know, uh, transatlantic security or uh, NATO-EU relations, I think we'll appreciate the historic nature of the, these, these agreements. There really has been, I feel, a change in the culture of the relationship. Um, cooperation is really now the expected norm, and it's expected uh, from the, the leadership uh, on down. It's clearly an expectation, and it's not the exception. So, for example, as I was telling uh, some, some of us uh, in, in just before this, that just this week we concluded a really unprecedented set of uh, parallel and coordinated exercises. Um, a lot of what we do in the military and in NATO is to do exercises um, in which NATO and the EU work together to address a fictitious yet I think realistic scenario uh, in, the, in the European space. And so uh, that in and of itself was a very important development. And next year, the EU will actually take the lead on uh, these parallel set of exercises. So as I said, it's an exciting time in NATO-EU relations. Since I'm approaching things from the legal perspective, the purpose of my presentation is to put out there the legal framework that's developed over the years to underpin this cooperation and actually make it possible not only in the uh, current um, desired configuration, but maybe uh, however the the relationship might develop in the future. Um, And uh, I actually think that um, in terms of kind of the disciplinarity of this, it's, it's, it's an interesting um, lens, the legal framework is, through which to understand, you know, not just the historical development of, of uh, European relations, but maybe suggest some areas um, for its future potential. So with your permission, let me just delve back into history a little bit. Some of this uh, sounds like ancient history uh, to people that are working in the field, but it's, it's um, I promise I won't go before 1990. Um, <laughs> it's not so ancient. Um, and here's what I think. I mean, I know maybe not everybody in here is, is a lawyer, but I actually think that this is a really prime example of how um, a range of institutions and structures, okay, and why do I say a range? Because actually there's more institutions involved in this whole game than just NATO and the EU, um, can actually be made to, through, um, you know, where there's political will and where there's some diplomatic and, and even legal um, uh, uh, energy put into it, um, they can be made to develop in a way that facilitates cooperation while at the same time respecting the different policy orientations um, not only of member states, but of the organizations themselves, as well as the decision-making autonomy and institutional integrity of each of the organizations. So this is a classic example of kind of international institutions uh, and international cooperation evolving in, in special ways. And I, I think it's worthy of, of, um, of study, and I hope you will you'll agree with this as well. So um, I mentioned that, there, that NATO and the EU were not all the only actors in this, in this uh, puzzle over the years. There's been a third actor, and this is where I'll go start going back in history. Uh, and just to point to uh, the Western European Union, the WEU, uh, which um, uh, has since been now, trans- it doesn't exist anymore, but um, it's, it was a key player 
uh, in, the, in, the, in the legal framework and the institutional framework for NATO-EU relations. So a first step, of course, was the adoption of the 1992 Maastricht Treaty on the European Union, which includes the provisions about the uh, Common Foreign and Security Policy, CFSP. So under the Maastricht Treaty, and of the lawyers in the room will forgive me, if, and especially since this is coming from a clearly non-EU uh, <laughs> person, forgive me for the, 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 the basic information, but the CFSP would include all areas of foreign and security policy um, and all questions related to the security of the Union, therefore also the military aspects. Um, and the WEU, the Western European Union, would serve as the European Union's military arm. Uh, the EU would request the, this is the way it was to work, the WEU to elaborate and implement decisions and actions of the European Union that would have uh, defense implications. Um, now, I don't need to uh, highlight, especially for this audience, a very important aspect of the Maastricht Treaty, and this is probably one of the first legal um, innovations, as it were, that has enabled things to, to move uh, forward appropriately, which is the important general provision that the CS CFSP shall not prejudice the specific character of the security and defense policy of certain member states. So, of course, we refer to this as the Irish Clause, but it also has facilitated the uh, subsequent membership in the, in the European Union of Austria, Finland, Sweden uh, um, in the years to follow. So um, at the same time, together with that clause, the Maastricht Treaty also provided that the CFSP shall respect the obligations of certain member states under the North Atlantic Treaty, which is NATO's treaty, um, and be compatible with the common security and defense policy that's established within that framework. So that's what we call the NATO clause. And that's the second innovation, uh, legal innovation, you can call it, that actually helps um, provide the kind of package that, that moves things forward. So on the one hand, the um, respect for the, the particular character of security and defense policy, and on the other hand, um, the NATO clause. So um, that was the first, uh, in, in the Master Treaty, the first step. The second step, uh, which kind of at the same time, was the adoption in 1992 of the so-called Petersburg tasks during a ministerial council of the the Western European Union. These tasks were meant to address a broad range of topics, um, many of which I think are dear to, to, to Irish policy as well, humanitarian and rescue tasks, uh, peacekeeping tasks, uh, crisis management, peace building, etc. Um, an important part of the Petersburg tasks was that the member states agreed to deploy their troops and resources um, from across the whole spectrum of the military under the authority of the WEU. Um, in accordance with their obligations under the UN and the North Atlantic Treaty. So the WAU became in this, this empowered vehicle to, to put together um, uh, certain, uh, certain tasks. Now, what to do with the WEU was, was a big question. So in 1996, at NATO's Berlin ministerial meeting, uh, an agreement was reached whereby the WEU would contribute to establishing a European security and defense identity as the so-called European pillar or as a European pillar uh, within NATO structures. So this was a, a very important compromise um, done at Berlin in 1996, which allowed the European states uh, through the WEU to access NATO assets. And actually it will come back, this whole Berlin arrangement will come back uh, in subsequent years. So um, moving forward, the EU included the Petersburg tasks in the Amsterdam Treaty in 1997. In 1999, it was decided that uh, the role of uh, WEU would be incorporated into, into the EU. Um, and then at the same time in 1999, at NATO's historic Washington summit, which was a very important summit for the uh, um, joining uh, NATO of, of a variety of, of um, Central and Eastern European states, the, ally, the NATO allies declared their readiness to, and I'm quoting here from the declaration, to define and adopt the necessary arrangements for ready access by the EU to the collective assets and capabilities of the alliance for the operations in which the alliance as a whole is not engaged militarily as an alliance. Um, so in other words, the NATO agreed to make certain NATO assets available in a kind of a variable way uh, to the European Union for, for certain European Union tasks that didn't, that didn't necessarily implicate um, the entire NATO uh, transatlantic grouping. Okay, so this was uh, important because it kind of finally concretized uh, 
um, the political agreement and kind of operationalize the political agreement that had been reached back in Berlin in 1996. So that was kind of the real kickoff for institutional relations between NATO and the EU. They were actually former, formally launched in 2001 with the establishment of joint meetings, uh, including at the level of foreign ministers and particularly uh, uh, ambassadors we often had. I know we have former ambassadors to the, uh, to the EU's uh, PSC here. We have these NAC PSC uh, type meetings. Um, there was an exchange of letters between the NATO Secretary General and the EU uh, presidency at the time, uh, defining the scope of cooperation and the modalities of consultation between the two organizations. So that was a kind of an important uh, legal step there. Um, there was then, as a result of this actually kind of formal interaction that had just started in 2001, um, and if you remember, 2001 was also a, a really crucial time for NATO as an alliance because it was the first time that we invoked Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, which is the collective security clause after the 9-11 attack. So 2001 was this incredibly formative year for NATO. Uh, a lot of people forget that it was actually formative on the NATO-EU front as well. Um, so in 2002, there was a NATO-EU declaration on the European security and defense policy which set out the political principles and reaffirmed the fact that the EU would get assured access to NATO's planning capabilities for the EU's own military operations. And so a lot of the discussions in the early 2000s, the early aughts, were around <coughs> how to assure uh, European Union access to NATO capabilities and not just, uh, not just um, make them, uh, have them be you know, possibly available, but to be available in an assured way. So this culminated in uh, what we call the Berlin Plus Agreement, uh, which was concluded on uh, 17th of March 2003, um, and which provided the institutional foundations of such cooperation. Maybe as a just an aside for the lawyers in the room, um, the, the, it's very interesting to look into the legal nature of the the Berlin Plus Agreement. It's it's kind of the important legal text that underpins the. Um, the, the whole, uh, even to this day, NATO-EU cooperation. And so uh, some scholars have, have had some views about the nature of the agreement. I'll just leave it at that if, if you're interested. It, it bears uh, some close attention. The agreement referred to a comprehensive package of arrangements, <coughs> exchanges of letters, declarations um, that were meant to, taken as a whole, constitute the framework for NATO-EU relations. And indeed, the main kind of operational thing was that they would allow the EU to use NATO structures, mechanisms, and assets to carry out military operations if NATO d declined to act. So, in you know, in the absence of a NATO um, action, let me just tell you a few other um, parts of the Berlin Plus Agreement. Part of the reason that I was having that caveat about the nature of the agreement is it's actually a whole bunch of uh, different pieces that are kind of put together into a package. Um, there are, and I think the colleagues from the, uh, the defense side will, will know this, that there are terms of reference for using NATO's deputy supreme commander of allied forces in Europe, who is a, is a European, uh, uh, for commanding EU-led operations, which is actually has occurred, in, for example, in Bosnia uh, now. There's assured EU access to NATO's planning capabilities. There's a presumption of availability to the European Union of certain pre-identified NATO assets, so uh, there's not only assured access to planning, but there's actually a presumption of availability of, of uh, listed things. Um, there are modalities for participation by EU staff in planning um, from NATO's perspectives. It's quite, quite interesting. And then there are further adaptation of NATO's defense planning system to uh, incorporate more comprehensively the availability of forces for EU-led operations. So this was really a, a considerable undertaking, this package, to make uh, uh, NATO assets available to help the European Union and to, to, to really, not just kind of in the act of a military operation, but in its planning and, and across the spectrum. The, this is a, a, an important legal note here. The implementation of this package was contingent upon the conclusion of an agreement between the NATO and the EU on the security of information. Uh, which was eventually concluded in March of 2003 as well. Um, it's an agreement that governs access to exchange and release of classified information between NATO on the one side and the, the um, Council of the European Union, 
the high representative at the European Commission. And then in 2010, um, we expanded it in order to cover the EEA, EEAS as well, the European External Action Service. Um, this is an incredibly important agreement that um, is, is really at the heart of NATO-EU cooperation. And um, it's an area, of course, of close continuing attention for us. Um, perhaps the last stop before we get to the present in our little journey is the Lisbon Treaty. Um, which brought about uh, many important changes, including, and this is where I think it's kind of interesting to think about um, potential for the future here, is including Article 42.7 of the Treaty on uh, European Union, which is the Mutual Assistance Clause of the TEU, um, which mirrors, uh, mirrors in some important ways the Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. So, um, the text just of that is, uh, if a member st of, the, of Article 42.7, if a member state is the victim, if an EU member state, is the victim of armed aggression on its territory, the other member states shall have towards it an obligation of aid and assistance by all means in their power in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter so on self-defense. It's not exactly the same language, but it's similar language to what we have in the North Atlantic Treaty, which says that if an armed attack occurs it's from 1949, uh, it shall be regarded as an armed attack against uh, all allies, and they'll take the, the necessary uh, steps uh, uh, to, in order to restore peace and security in the North Atlantic area. So um, we see the famous, um, uh, the famous Irish Clause and the NATO Clauses uh, appear there in Article 42.7 as well, which is important to help uh, uh, to help uh, reiterate those principles. Um, but what I think here is quite interesting, and it's maybe um, especially now that I've found out about this interesting project that's going on here at the Institute about the future of Europe, um, I think it would be interesting to think about the potential interplay between Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty and Article 42.7 of the TEU. Um, each of them, I mean, it's a little bit difficult because each of them has only been invoked once. So, as I said, Article 5 of the Washington, the North Atlantic Treaty, we sometimes also call the Washington Treaty, was invoked after 9-11. Um, and Article 42.7 of the TEU, as you know, was invoked by France following the 2015, the November 2015 terrorist attacks in Paris. They're both very flexible provisions in that, you know, once triggered, they uh, are, are you know, rather open-ended in terms of what um, assistance can be brought to bear to help the, the afflicted state or the victim state. Um, and they really do enable uh, a wide range of potential responses. They've, well, I mean, it's obvious since each has only been invoked once uh, and on different occasions that they've never been invoked at the same time, although this possibility is, is not excluded. Um, in this case, for NATO allies, the NATO clause, which we call the NATO first policy, would apply. But in a, such a situation, NATO and the EU could contribute each in their own ways to a wide range of areas. So um, that kind of completes my quick history of the legal framework for NATO-EU cooperation. Um, I just want to say a little bit what we're doing um, right now. I said that last July in Warsaw, um, the uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, President Putus, President Juncker signed a joint declaration uh, and that we're in the middle of, of doing now kind of practical uh, proposals based on the, the declaration. Let me just give you an idea of some of the things that we're doing and then I'll, and then I'll conclude. Um, well, even before the declaration, we were very active, NATO and the EU, in crisis management and operations, particularly in the Western Balkans in the 90s and Afghanistan uh, since 9-11. So, and at the same time, uh, maritime security has become a very fertile area of NATO-EU cooperation. So the NATO and EU naval forces have worked together in counter-piracy missions. And then also more interestingly, I th or not more interestingly, but also interestingly, they've worked together uh, to help counter the refugee and migration crisis. So um, I can maybe say a little bit about that because I think it's maybe not an area that, that people um, know too much about. In February 2016, NATO defense ministers decided that NATO should try to assist with, with the uh, growing refugee and migrant crisis in Europe. Uh, NATO deployed a maritime force to the Aegean Sea, which we call the Aegean Sea, the Aegean sea Activity, um, to conduct reconnaissance, monitoring, and surveillance of, of illegal crossings uh, 
And we were, in this regard, supporting the Turkish and Greek authorities, as well as the EU Frontex. Now, this Aegean Sea activity was really the hot, hot, one hotbed, I would say, for promoting um, legal cooperation, because in order to enable, uh, I was saying, what does NATO do? We, we, we basically do surveillance that is then passed on to uh, either the coastal states or to Frontex, the EU agency. Um, so we were able to put in place a technical agreement at the operational level to support this work. Um, and I think that that's one of those areas, actually, where we've been able to use the legal instruments to actually really have an impact on um, European security. Um, I should also flag in the mar mar maritime area that um, NATO leaders have agreed to take on uh, a role in supporting the EU's Operation Sophia, uh, which is not in the Aegean Sea, but is more in the central Mediterranean. Uh, and we'll see, we're sort of figuring out the modalities of, of how to do that right now. Um, uh, and I think that that'll be another area where NATO-EU cooperation will really, um, will really take off. Let me just point out two other areas where we're working together before I finish here. Um, one is in the area of countering hybrid threats. So um, those of you who uh, follow uh, the debates around hybrid uh, warfare, hybrid threats, will know that there has been just established at Helsinki uh, a new center uh, a European, it's called the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. It was just inaugurated uh, this month, earlier this month. But I think it has a potential to be a, a really excellent focal point for work on the hybrid threats that are facing um, transatlantic community in, in the current environment. And obviously, countering hybrid threats is not just a military uh, issue. It's an issue that brings to bear a lot of different things, law enforcement, um, counter-propaganda, education, anti-radicalization, and it's a, I think it's a classic area where the different strengths of uh, groupings like NATO and the European Union could really be brought to bear in a kind of interesting and, and cooperative way. Um, so keep an eye out for this uh, Helsinki Hybrid Center. Uh, as, it, as it gets off the ground. Finally, we work cl together closely in the cyber area, and maybe that's my last legal point. Um, we, there's been a real, uh, last year a very groundbreaking memorandum of understanding that was signed between the computer incident response teams, the CERTs uh, of NATO and the EU in Brussels, and actually this has already enabled uh, quite a lot of work to happen to um, counter various uh, cyber attacks that have happened even over the course of, of just this year. So, um, I mean, to sum up, I think in the current strategic environment, the EU and NATO are faced with unprecedented challenges, and the reality is that neither organization has the full range of tools to address security challenges on its own. Um, activities of the two organizations are clearly complementary to each other, um, and EU-NATO cooperation is, uh, is a, also a kind of joint work that definitely fits into the current um, atmosphere in the international community about burden sharing across the Atlantic. Um, cooperation between the two organizations is essential, and I, would, I, I think this is the moment to, to uh, discuss and appreciate this. Maybe before I, I move on to your questions, um, I want to just say a word about uh, not really NATO-EU cooperation in the sense that I've been talking about it here, but the issue of um, the European uh, uh, security and defense or European defense. There's, the, there's, for example, we were discussing the recent white paper that was put out in this regard. Um, and the European Union has taken substantial steps uh, there. There's a launching of the permanent structured cooperation, which is called PESCO. Uh, as you know, there's a European Defense Fund, the EDF, um, the creation of the Military Planning Conduct Capability, the MPCC, and the Coordinated Annual Review on Defense, the CARD. Um, so a lot is happening in this area right now. I just want to um, uh, clarify that NATO has welcomed these initiatives, provided that they're developed in a spirit of coherence, complementarity, and transparency. Um, and in this context, the possible modalities for the involvement of non-EU allies within NATO so the, the North American countries uh, and other uh, players will, who do contribute substantially to European defense will be of paramount importance. And I actually think that that points to uh, the role of legal arrangements, actually not just in regulating the past uh, glories of NATO-EU cooperation, but actually 
um, setting up a, uh, a good foundation for uh, not only the increased level of ambition that we have nowadays, but maybe uh, what is to come. So um, I really do think that the, the core principles of the framework, which are you know, the respect for different policy orientations, the respect for different mandates, and the enabling of cooperation, but at the same time, decision-making autonomy and institutional integrity of each organization. So working together yet remaining, uh, 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 having autonomy, provide a, a solid foundation for this work. So I'm, I'd be very happy to, to discuss with you further. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.